Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for this time of worship. You may be seated. And I'm going to invite Pastor Norma up for a continuation of the word of, on Ephesians. Thanks to the worship team who loves Zoe today. She's here for the first time. Damien, young one stepping up. Let's just encourage them all. Thank you, Antoinette. Well, I have a mystery here. It is secret. Now, those who are in the 9 a.m. service, you are not to tell anyone. What is underneath this? Because it is veiled, secret, and hidden. I'm going to reveal it at the end of my message. Because today, yes, it's a mystery. Today I'm going to reveal a mystery to you. Are you excited? Who loves secrets? That's why we wrap presents up in paper. So you have to open it. Oh, I love it. And I'm going to unwrap something for you today to reveal a mystery. But this mystery was revealed many years ago by Paul in the book of Ephesians. Now last Sunday, Antoinette did an amazing job explaining to us about what Ephesus was like, where this book was written to. Ephesus was a large, thriving, cosmopolitan, multi-ethnic seaport city, the second in size only to Rome. And to this cosmopolitan, ethnic hotpot of people, of 250,000 people, Paul came and he writes this letter to explain and to continue to explain what he started to share with them there about the mystery that he has been revealed to him that he is revealing to them. And when we think about who this letter was written to, you know, it really highlights to us that this wasn't a small place. It took bravery, it took boldness for Paul to go there to this huge city. Sometimes we think, oh, it was just a little village and it was easy for him to speak. No, it was a huge city. It was like going to Melbourne or to Sydney and standing there and speaking out. And we know that Paul now, it's, it's later on since he's been there, and Paul is writing back to the church there and he's in prison. So he's writing this letter from prison. And he's in prison because of this mystery. Oh, this is a mystery, isn't it? He is in prison because of this mystery. Because some people didn't like this. They didn't like this revelation that God had given him to share. So today I'm going to pick four, four words that are said over and over again in Ephesians 2 to 3 as we continue on. First of all, the first word is mystery. The second one is grace. The third one is reconciled. And the fourth one is citizenship. And then these two chapters finish with Paul's second prayer in these books. And I'm going to pray that over you as I finish this message today. But first of all, let's have a look at the word mystery. It's found six times in the book of Ephesians, the word mystery, more than any other book in the Bible. Now, I already said a mystery is something that is obscure or hidden or secret or veiled like this here. It's a truth hidden until now, but now disclosed by the revelation of God to Paul. And what is this mystery that has been revealed to Paul? Well, let's have a look and let Ephesians itself speak. So here in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2, we have this word. How many times can you see the word mystery there? three times in just this short passage of scripture. It says, Paul's writing to them, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is a mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by God's spirit by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery, now this is it, 
this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. And you might say, so? So what? Now, this is revolutionary. Until this time, the Jews were the only ones that were included in the work of God. Now, any Jews here today? Oh, I don't see any hands. That means you're all excluded. You're all left out. You're all no good. Is that right? Is it? Well, back then, yes. You would have felt like that. I'm not the chosen one. I'm excluded. I'm not chosen. I'm not accepted. Who am I? Ah, but this mystery is being explained. And Paul is saying, I'm really unworthy to do this because I'm the least of all of the Lord's people. But this grace was given to me, to me, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent that was that now through the what? It doesn't say synagogue. It doesn't say temple. It doesn't say tabernacle. Why? It says the church. Ah, God is setting up something new with this revelation. Now through the church, the manifest wisdom of God should be made known to all the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This is it. We're drawing a line. This is pushing down walls. This is opening up God's heaven in a new way, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may now approach God with fear and trembling. Is that right? Is that what it says there? What does it say? It says with freedom and with confidence. That's right. Now this mystery is that God would form a new comprehensive union from all kinds of people. Look around here. We have all kinds of people here. Some of us look a bit odd. I'm talking about myself, of course. <laughs> all kinds of people, Jew or Gentile, male or female, black or white, a new spiritual entity called the church, which has never existed before. Are you having a revelation on this? The Old Testament, there was no church there. In the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle. You know, they would carry it around with them wherever they went, set it up. It was based on God's pattern that he gave to Moses with the outer court, the holy place and the holy of holies. And then, of course, downloaded again to David. He built a permanent temple based on pattern of the tabernacle and they would go and worship there and then in the time when Jesus came to earth there was not just a temple but there were local synagogues but were the Gentiles allowed to go there were they allowed to serve there no they were excluded have you ever felt excluded bullied left out marginalized all of us have at some time well, then this message is for you today. This mystery that is being revealed is for you today. God did away with the temple. Remember, it was destroyed in 70 AD and Jesus said, look at this temple as his disciples said, how beautiful is that temple? Jesus said, not one stone is going to be left upon another. Why? Because he was setting up something new with this mystery and that was the church. You and me, the church. And Jesus showed this when he died on the cross. Something very miraculous and significant happened in the temple. What was that? The veil was torn in two, opening up the way for all mankind to have access into the Holy of Holies. Gentiles are now full partakers of his promise, joined together into one church, no longer separated. And this was a message that had got Paul put into prison because the Jews did not like this. They didn't like this. You know, has anyone ever read the book Animal Farm? Yeah. 
I had to read that when I was in school. And it's all about these animals. And they're all complaining because the farmer is dictating to them. He's ruling over them. So they say, they gang up together and they oust the farmer. And so they all take over. But guess what? Into that vacuum of leadership come the pigs. And they're worse than the farmer in the way that they dominate and dictate. See, we're never going to solve it in this way. And the Jews, okay, well, why did God call the Jews? Why were they so special? You may say, well, didn't God set it up that way? In the beginning, it was not like that. Remember, Adam and Eve were made in the image of God and every person born is made in the image of God. But there was a problem of sin. So God chose a man who was faithful to him, Abraham, that out of his lineage and descendants would come a people called the Hebrews, the Jews eventually, they were called, who would be so contagious in their Christianity or in their God-fearing obedience of him that they would draw people to him. But you know what? Man's propensity is to become pride, proud, arrogant, and love to have the power and the prestige. And instead, the Jews, instead of proclaiming God's love to the people, they weren't about looking down their noses at people and not at all exemplifying the love of God. This was just a temporary thing. Also, God set up this nation to preserve Judah, the line of Judah, so that from that, the Messiah could come. The Messiah, that would be the solution to the segregation and unite them back together again like they were in the Garden of Eden. So we have the next word, and I love this word, grace. We are saved through faith in Christ Jesus and not by our own efforts or work. Faith, grace alone, faith alone. Now, this morning, Emmanuel, as we were praying, had a scripture which goes on in Ephesians chapter four. It says, now therefore I beseech you, brethren, to walk worthy of the calling. Now we could zoom straight to that and often we do. Work, work, work. Oh, I have to work, work walk worthy. And, you know, there's been some words today about feeling guilty, feeling not good enough, and we're so burdened down. We can't zoom to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, without the revelation of what comes before, because there's two sides to the coin. There's what God has done and our response to it. But so often we're on the one side, trying to work, trying to work hard, where it begins and ends with God and we do our best and God does the rest. I love that. Grace alone, faith alone. Grace alone means that God loves, forgives and saves us, not because of who we are or what we do, but because of the work of Christ. I love that. And you know, this week on Wednesday, I had the privilege of sharing at um, a devotion at the school. And I was sharing about the two sides of the coin two sides of the story. And I, I was sharing about when I was a student, how God just revolutionized my whole identity and the reason and perspective about why I do things by a revelation on this. And I changed from being a C student to a high achieving student, not through my own work, but yes it was, in my response to understanding who I was in God, it just blew my mind. And now I'm not just aimlessly studying because I have to, I'm doing it because I live and I move and I have my being in him. He just changed my life. And as a result of that, there were many rewards that God blessed me with. And then after that, a line of some VCE students came up for me to pray for them and one of them was crying. Because she said, I used to have that revelation I used to have that relationship with God and now it's all about striving and she was crying. I want to get back to that, she said. I was so privileged to be part of that prayer for her, that fresh awakening of the mystery of grace alone, faith alone. Grace alone means that God loves, forgives and saves us, not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of the work of Christ. And Christ here is the agent used to unite us. And the message of the mystery is that Jesus is the Messiah for both the Jew and the Gentile. When I say Gentile, I'm talking about you because there's no Jews here. You would have all been excluded. 
both sides are saved in the same way through faith in Jesus. And that's not what the religious leaders of the day wanted to hear. What? You're telling us we have to humble ourselves and come to the foot of the cross? No way. We don't even believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But this message for those who believe set them absolutely free and set up a new way for us to worship and a new vehicle which was the church. Because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. For it's by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace alone that you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves and never will be, never has been. It is a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us. You see, the Jews wanted to keep on boasting. Look how good I am. Look how I obey the law. Look how much money I've given. Look, I'm not a sinner like that person over there. They were boasting. And Jesus came and wiped that underneath their feet. They didn't like that. Paul is sharing this mystery that now all people are reconciled. Jews and Gentiles reconciled. Now I want you to think of someone who you really, really don't like. Maybe you don't have anyone in your life, good on you, but maybe you think of someone who really annoys you and you really don't like. I want to tell you today that God has given you the ministry of reconciliation. He came to reconcile. Citizens now are given, sorry, Gentiles are given citizenship. They're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, members of the one household, built into a holy temple to contain God's presence, grafted into one body. I love that. That's what the church is, a household, a temple, a body. And I love this. We are made now into one new humanity. Look around you. This is your family. It looks different. It's varied. You've come from different places in the world. And this is what church should look like. No racial discrimination, no barriers, no walls, no racial prejudice. That's what church should look like. One new humanity. It is only through the gospel where all men have equal standing in Jesus because of the grace of God. All of us now are reconciled to one another and to God. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, remember that at that time you were separate from God, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants and the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. How powerful is that? In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, it was still a Jewish thing. Only the occasional outsider seemed to be included, like the woman at the well, you know, the Samaritan. But suddenly, in the book of Acts, we see those who were outcasts are play, playing a big part in what God is doing. It's no longer God's chosen few standing against the rest of the world. Through Jesus, Israel's national exclusivity has become an international inclusivity to everyone. How good is that? Because he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create to himself a new one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. What's that word there? Peace. Peace. 
and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. I want to tell you that the gospel of Christ is the means of genuine ethnic and social reconciliation. Not a voice referendum. That's not going to do it. Yes, I voted this week. And the people have spoken. That's not what's going to bring reconciliation. That's not what's going to close the gap. And of course, this week, we've heard horrendous stories from the war that's happening between Israel and the Gaza Strip, Gaza, you know, the West Bank and the Palestinians. And how sad is that? You know, they signed a pre peace treaty. How long did that last for? Because unless mankind's heart is changed, there is no peace. There is no true reconciliation. We are so blessed to live in this nation. You know, I was doing a bit of research on citizenship and all the things that you have to read up. And as I was reading about our nation, I was becoming so proud of being part of living in this nation where if you read all the standards of citizenship, and who's done that? Yes, many of you who've taken out citizenship. That's right. And it says that this is a nation of equality, a nation of equal opportunity for everyone, a nation where people should be able to practice their own faith and beliefs in a democratic way, with respect Dignity for one another. That's citizenship. And it's only a genuine heart change that's going to take away racial divides. Barriers that separated us in Christ have been limited and removed. And we have been brought into citizenship before we were excluded, before we were not able to access the promises and provisions, before we were foreigners without hope, racial discrimination, hostility. But citizenship gives you the opportunity to fully participate in our nation's life and community. And one thing I do as a minister of religion and past is I sign lots of people's pieces of paper for citizenship and for identification, for going for their citizenship. And I know that you must meet certain criteria before you can apply. You have to sit the Australian citizenship test. Who's done that? You know, if I did that, I might not pass. I might, no, out with her. I might not be able to answer all those questions about my nation. Even though I've lived here for a long time, or since I was born, actually. But do you know that to join as a citizen of God, there is no pass or fail. There's only accepting. Yes. And that's Christ accepting yes. to die on the cross for you. You accepting the work that he did on the cross. There's no test. There's no, da -da, out with you, you failed the test. And did you know that the Australian Citizen Act was put into place in 1949. And just in the last year, 1,903, sorry, 193,947 people have become Australian citizens, representing over 200 nations. How can they all live in peace and harmony with one another? because of our constitution based on Christianity, bringing us a heart of respect, dignity, fairness and equality. But guess what? When Jesus died on the cross, he set up a citizenship act that goes on to all eternity and gives us a guaranteed place in the kingdom of heaven. How amazing is that? And so this is church. This is what church should look like. People of every ethnicity, background, coming together, kingdom culture. Because consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens of God's people and members of his household. 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. That's the church. We are the temple of God. And him, him, him too, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is good news for all, for the 195 nations of the world, for the 7,000 spoken languages of the world, 300 of them only which have a written system, the rest are oral. 5,000 distinct groups and tribes, and I think a lot of them are in Africa and Papua New Guinea, to be honest. 800 of those languages alone are in Papua New Guinea. How can people be united when they're tribal? How volatile is places like Africa? But what unites them across all those nations is Christ and kingdom culture. Did you know, though, that there are still a hundred uncontacted tribes in the world in Peru, Brazil, and Bolivia and South America who've never seen the outside world, who are always still to this day living as they have for centuries. How amazing is that to think that in our civilized world there are over a hundred of those people groups still existing. But I've got good news for you. Through the church, everyone can find an international home. And the only prerequisite is faith through grace. Grace received by faith. But you can still come even if you haven't received that. But hopefully we will be so contagious and Christ will be portrayed so powerfully that it won't be very long before you take out citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. This is powerful. You know, every day we are faced with discrimination. We are faced with barriers and hostilities. We all are. We have them. We have them happen in our world. We have them happen. And so what I want to challenge us, and I'll get the worship team to come up. I want to challenge us. Sometimes we think, well, what's my ministry? What's my calling? I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to reveal the mystery of your ministry. You have been given a ministry of reconciliation. That's your ministry. In your world, in your family, in your community, bringing people to God and bringing them to one another. It's so true. When we plug ourselves into God, Things unravel in our lives and situations. And I just want to share quickly two stories just from last Sunday. It was so powerful. It was like, wow, God, you're amazing. You know, people that have only recently come to our church and time with them and know a little bit about their situations. In between the 9 and the 11 o'clock service, a lady came to me. She said, I want to tell you that today I'm going for lunch with my family. Our family has not been together for 15 years because of the things that have happened with drugs and estrangement and hostilities. And today, and she said, I feel a strange peace about it. I said, that's because this is a God thing. And we prayed for her and I checked in with her today. How powerful was it? It was true. It was like all the animosity had gone because she had the ministry of reconciliation, which she activated through prayer and her relationship, stepping up, taking the higher road. And then would you believe, Sunday night after the service, a guy that I've been ministering with because he cannot forgive, he's holding on to unforgiveness. And one of the things, one of the areas in um, his sports club, where he couldn't stand someone else in the sports club that he was playing with. And the coach knew and would always keep them apart. For 10 years, this animosity has been going on. He could not forgive this guy for the terrible things that he'd said and done. He said, would you believe I turned up to my sports club last weekend and the coach had put us on the same team. And I had to challenge myself, what do I do here? Do I rant and rave to the coach? But you know what, instead I remembered that this man 
had just recently, him and his partner had had a baby, his wife. So I said, hey, mate, I heard you had a baby. How's that going? And he said, just like that, would you believe it? Ten years of animosity just slipped away into nothingness. And the rest of the game, they were interacting. And afterwards, during the, you know, the refreshment time, they were connecting like old mates, as if it had never happened. And that's what God does, you see. That's what he did with the Jews and the Gentiles, but it's up to us. And those Jews could have said, no way. I'm not going to include you. We've had the word, we've had the law, we've had the tabernacle all these years, no way. And the Gentiles could have said, well, I've always been left out. I'm a victim. How could I believe that about myself? And Paul is saying, that's why I want to pray this prayer over you. All of you here, I want you to close your eyes and I'm just going to finish with this prayer that he finishes chapter 3 with because he knows that this is going to take some rethinking, some reframing, some challenging of perspectives and discrimination and racial divides. It's going to challenge them. And they're going to need to understand that it's a deep love of God that disrupts this. To understand the ramifications of this mystery revealed so that the barriers don't come up again. So they continue to accept one another as family, brothers and sisters in the law, where there's been animosities for generations and generations. And Paul prays, for this reason, and I can see him kneeling in the prison, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in the Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever Amen and the conclusion for this is God's mystery is revealed the church filled with people from all tribes and tongues languages nations saved by grace a new humanity diverse but citizens of God's kingdom and what matters is God's grace and our faith responds to His grace. And when we do that, we let go of grudges, divisions, dissensions, unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness. And we take on the ministry of reconciliation. This is a mystery revealed. I'm going to show you now the mystery revealed here. Can you see it? I'll take this back. I'm going to unveil it now. This is a mystery revealed here. It's a cross of Christ. And a whole lot of goodies and provisions for us across the whole world here. The mystery of Christ. Amen. Let's just um, sing this song to finish. And if anyone needs prayer, please come up. If you need that ministry of reconciliation to be stirred within you. You're having a problem forgiving, letting go, reconciling. God is here today.